Uh, we have a next session, which is the figures of Kubernetes, the evolution of development and operations at Google and beyond by Tarek. Uh, I used to work at Red Hat, but now he's at Google. Should be an absolutely great talk. Probably one of my favorite speakers from, my for from his former days at Red Hat. So give it up for Tarek. OK. Am I on? Can everyone hear me OK? Everyone in the back? OK, very good. All right, so my name is Tarek Islam. Um, and uh, just a little bit about me to get started before we get into the meat of it. This is uh, a large part of who I am. This is my family. Um, and I've got three boys, and we're expecting our fourth in the next two weeks. So uh, this is actually how my wife uh, told me she, we were expecting for our fourth. So we're having a girl, thankfully, and we're shutting it down <laughs> after that. <laughs> uh, I am a specialist in Kubernetes. Um, this is something that I have grown to love. Uh, a great deal over the years. Uh, I work on the Google Cloud side of things, and uh, I'm a native to the DC area, um, unfortunately, as a sports fan. Although, go Caps, we're going to do it this time. It's going to happen. Can't say too much about the skins, unfortunately. I'm still recovering. Uh, I went to tech, so again, local here, Virginia, Virginia native, and uh, really just the DC area has kind of been my, my bread and butter. I've covered public sector for my entire career, pretty much. Uh, and I have enjoyed every step of it. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I am kubeguy at google.com. Seriously. Um, and those are my other contacts on social media. So who's seen this movie, Hidden Figures? It's a really good movie. Um, the premise of it, for those of you that haven't seen it, is, is that these three amazing individuals, uh, African-American women, they, they trailblaze within NASA in terms of um, really socio-political considerations, academic considerations. I mean, the things that they were able to accomplish in the time that they were in there are, are monumental. Um, they were known as computers. Uh, Dorothy Vaughn, the one in the middle, uh, she's the main protagonist in this film. So the movie kind of follows her for the, mo for, for the majority of the duration of the film. But she and her colleagues here, they were known as the original computers before digital computers were a thing. Now the reason I call this out is because one aspect of their story is how they were able to, under very extreme conditions, transform themselves. They were able to not just adapt, but they were able to up-level what they did and how they did it for NASA as an organization. Before NASA was even NASA, it was NACA, however you want to say that. Um, Dorothy Vaughn, in particular, uh, as she was a computer, a human computer, they were calculating flight paths, they were calculating, I mean, to the, my, the smallest, tiniest detail. They were trying to figure out how the Navy could pick up a pod, and I use that term on purpose right now, uh, within a 20 square mile radius after having been shot ballistically into outer space. Um, so you can imagine the math that goes into that. They had to do all of this by hand with modern day with the tools of the day. IBM came in and they introduced the first uh, semiconductor powered, uh, or sorry, transistor powered computer. And so Dorothy took it upon herself to actually learn Fortran. She taught herself while raising six children, uh, as well as you know again all of the other you know racial considerations of the time, the pressures that she had as a woman as well, uh, in a in a very male dominated uh, culture. She was able to learn Fortran. She was able to actually pick things up very quickly and enable those around her. And in doing so, she transformed not only herself and her colleagues, but also NASA as an organization. They no longer were just computers. They were not human computers. They became software developers. Uh, you know, they took the skill sets that they, that they learned using a new technology, and they, able, they were able to up-level everything that the organization did. The things that they achieved, I mean, again, I, I could spend literally two hours going over their achievements, if not more than that. But that's the piece I want to focus on today, the ability for people to be able to take a technology and to enable themselves and become better for that as an organization. Now, Kubernetes, obviously, this is the lead-in, right? Kubernetes is a technology like that. Um, Kubernetes, from a Google perspective, it is all of our best practices made consumable. Um, it is something that Google has been doing for some time. We, for those of you that are aware of Google's Borg, uh, that is the legacy of Kubernetes. 
Um, internally at Google, we run our containers on an orchestration platform called the Borg. And if you look at the architectures between the two, they're actually relatively the same. In principle, they are the same. In practice, they are the same. Uh, their technical implementation, however, is very different. How we operate internally at Google uh, using the Borg is how we envision organizations, government agencies to use Kubernetes. The way our software development teams use the Borg, uh, we envision folks to use Kubernetes. So it's not just the architecture that's the same, but the principles, the design, um, whether you want to call it DevOps or Agile or whatever, whatever the term of the day is, uh, the underlying idea today that I want to communicate is that you want to have the technology enable you to do better things, be better, faster, more efficient, focus on what matters, the culture and the people and the process, not so much the technology itself. The technology is simply an enabling thing. Much like the Borg enables us at Google to do many different things at a very, very high rate, uh, we envision this to be able to be something that can enable organizations and even government agencies, yes, government agencies, to be able to operate at that level as well. Now, if the community is any indication, these are actually all Kubernetes distributions, this entire list. And this is, this is a subset. This isn't even all of them. This is all that I could fit on this slide um, until I got tired of typing. But if this is any indication, Kubernetes, it's not a flash in the pan. It's here to stay. It is an actual thing. It is not going anywhere. And I encourage everyone to adopt it at this point in some form or fashion, right? So it, it is, it, if this is any indication, it is, it is the way that we're going to be deploying applications and workloads moving forward. Now, from our standpoint, um, again, you know, everyone is adopting Kubernetes. Google is unique in the sense that we were born in it, right? We, we open sourced Kubernetes after its creation. And again, it stems from the Borg. It stems more from, from how we deliver code, how we deliver applications, how we deliver our workloads, more than just the technology itself. That's what I mean by this slide. It's not just, you know, we created Kubernetes and open sourced it. It's all of our practices in terms of application and software delivery packaged up into a framework that everyone can use now to be able to mimic that practice in some form or fashion. Now at Google, everything runs in a container. When, I, when we talk about the Borg, it is a very large, very monolithic container orchestration system. We run about four billion containers every week. So if you're using Google Search, for those of you that are on your phone instead of listening to me right now, you are spinning up a container in our data centers currently. The Borg spans thousands upon thousands upon thousands of nodes, um, and it's planet-wide. So it's an extremely scalable container orchestration system, but it's not very flexible because it's been built over the course of over a decade. Uh, and that's exactly why we created Kubernetes, because we wanted to have something more flexible, more consumable. And even our own internal engineers to this day are now using our own distribution of Kubernetes. It's something that is, to Jamie's point earlier, it's, it's evolutionary, right? Um, but whether you use Maps or YouTube, any one of our services, nothing exists in our infrastructure except that it runs in a container. Uh, and no, we don't run Docker, right? We don't have a daemon, going back to Jamie's talk. Um, we have our own kind of container format, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, it is based on C groups and namespaces. We, we created, we developed the C group construct back in 2006, 2007. Jamie probably knows better than me. Um, and contributed that back up to the Linux kernel. But the idea is that everything we do, even our VM instances in our cloud, run inside of a container. And that's why you get certain performance enhancements in that regard. Now, this scale that we're able to operate at 4 billion containers, I mean, that's a lot of containers. That's serving a planet-wide customer base or consumer base. Um, the same infrastructure that runs YouTube, that runs Google Cloud, that runs Gmail, all of this is running in, in containers. This type of sh scale is something that we want to share with the world. Um, and when I say scale, I'm not talking about four billion containers. I'm not talking about government agencies spinning up you know, thousands or millions, maybe thousands, but not necessarily millions or billions of containers, not necessarily, right? That day might come one, one, one day, but it's not, it's not here today. Right now, what we see, and, and again, the folks, uh, my colleagues here can, can attest to this, uh, a lot of government agencies, frankly, we're, we're just starting out, right, with containers. We're, even those agencies that are more mature, uh, 
we're looking at maybe dozens, hundreds. I've seen, the maximum I've seen is, is 1,000, maybe 10,000 containers, which is actually a good number. Um, but we're not approaching the million or the billion landmark point. The scale that I'm talking about that we want to share is, is really around process, around methodology, around whether it's, again, DevOps or SRE or whatever you want to call it. It's how you actually deliver your workloads and your code out. Um, that's the type of scale that we're talking about. And this slide is really meant to convey the fact that Kubernetes in general is, is, is becoming ubiquitous across verticals, right? Whether it's gaming, uh, whether it's music, whether it's, uh, you know, <laughs> light bulbs. Um, I like the candles analogy that Jamie had earlier. Whether it's Google engineers, they're using Kubernetes to actually deploy Google services today. Um, or whether it's government, right? The idea behind Kubernetes is that it serves all use cases, right? Uh, a lot of customers, a lot of folks, um, you know, often ask me, what, what use cases does Kubernetes cover? And the list is so great, the, the easier question to answer is what list doesn't Kubernetes cover at this point, right? Um, the, the, the variety of workloads is so diverse now that are supported by Kubernetes, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, case in point, I mean, even internally at Google, on the Borg, you look at all of Google's workloads and how, how diverse they are from machine learning and AI, as controversial as that has been in the media recently, um, to you know, just running static websites. All of it runs on an, a container orchestration system or platform. So we dog food it, we proselytize it, everyone else uses it as well at scale and at small scale as well. So it's not, it's not something that, I don't want people to think that Kubernetes is something that I have to, you know, I have to have a certain number of containers instantiated to be able to leverage Kubernetes. Even if you only have a dozen containers, Kubernetes can still bring value because of how you're going to market with your, your workloads and your applications. Now, some have asked us, why did we release Kubernetes? This is our secret sauce. This is how we deploy things. This is how we do things and, and, and why we're so good at what we do at Google. A lot of this has to do with our DNA. Um, and, and this is actually very fitting because you know, uh, th this event being sponsored by Red Hat, being the largest open source company in the world, um, part of our DNA is also in large part open source. We are actually contributors to over 2,000 open source projects. Uh, this list right here is a subset of open source technologies that we have created and open sourced to the world. And I highlighted in blue a few of them uh, namely Chrome, Kubernetes, and GVisor. Can anyone tell me why? How are they even related? Does anyone know what uh, GVisor is? Okay, so for those of you that don't know, GVisor is basically, I only have 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> GVisor is a way for me to be able to uh, virtualize the user space in a container, or in a pod, I should say. I guess that's the best way of putting it. Not entirely accurate, but I don't have time to actually be accurate right now. Um, so Jamie was talking about SecComp earlier, right? Filtering out or whitelisting uh, system calls to protect the host from a container. Uh, GVisor gives you the ability to virtualize that space, and you can then allow any system call that you want. Uh, and if there's a breakout or any violation of that, you're still protected because this is essentially uh, acting as a VM for a container. It's, it's like a, a virtualized environment for, for, container run, for a container to run in. Um, it's what we use internally for sandboxing, for untrusted workloads. Um, but it's something that we open sourced recently. Kubernetes obviously being the reason we're here today. And Chrome I have highlighted because Chrome actually is one of the earliest uh, container-based platforms container-based operating systems, for those of you that are familiar with Chrome OS. So if you're familiar with CoreOS's container operating system or Google's container operating system, both of them are based off of Chrome or Chromium. Uh, so the initial sandboxing was done in Chrome. So just some trivia there. So what we do is we create these technologies, we open source them, we deliver them to the community, and then you know, we, we initiate feedback loops and we deliver them as services as well. Now, how does this relate to DevOps, right? Um, I'm not going to have a talk about DevOps, don't worry. This is just meant to talk about how Google has used things like the Borg and now increasingly Kubernetes to go from what you see on the left side of the screen to the right side, 
right? And we've all seen slides like this. I just like this because it was drawn really well. I didn't make it. But you have the developer throwing something over. It's all bad. But what happens here is, you know, the technology, the underlying technology, the underlying framework that's enabling this happy state of delivery, it's, it's really just an, a detail, right? At Google, when our software engineers are delivering code, they're not, they're not worried about containers. They're not worried about, hey, you know, I need to write a Docker file or I need to write you know, something to package up my application. They, we have automations in place as a function of Kubernetes and the Borg to be able to simply just push code out and see the ending result. Right? To Jamie's earlier point about not having to worry about building containers, but worry about the capability of delivering code faster. Right? I've been to government agencies that are only able to release twice a year. Twice a year. They have some of the smartest analysts in the world that are trying to execute on mission, but they need features faster. So imagine being able to go from twice a year to twice a month. Right? What would, what's that? The robots don't hurt, they don't bite, exactly. There's no you know, nefarious AI here or anything. But the idea here, it's not, it's not about, I'm not calling out different specific automation tools, it's more about the fact that you can grow a culture and a series of processes and put them in place using tools like Kubernetes which enable automation for you. Class SRE implements DevOps. So this is specifically how we at Google implement DevOps. So SRE is a thing at Google. We kind of wrote the initial book on it. And it's a growing paradigm across many organizations today. I've noticed on LinkedIn, actually, a lot of folks are not calling themselves SRE. And I'm like, well, do you know what SRE really means? Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's catching on. But really, you know, it's not SRE versus DevOps. I've seen that out on, on different social media sites as well. It's, it's the fact that at Google, SRE has always been an implementation of DevOps principles. Okay? It's not one or the other. Now, that doesn't mean for a government agency, for you all out here, that your agency or your organization has to go the SRE route. For you, it's going to be class whatever you want to call it implements DevOps. You take the principles of DevOps, you take the, the toolings that, that are aligned with DevOps, things like containers and Kubernetes, and you create something, a culture, that aligns with your mission. You can call it SRE if you want. You can call it DevOps if you want. You can call it Agile if you want. You can call it whatever you want, but at the end of the day, it's going to be unique to you, just as it's unique to Google. Because of this, because of SRE, because of the practices that we've implemented using uh, SRE as, as an implementation of DevOps, these are the numbers that we're posting up on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a lot. I mean, these numbers are kind of unfathomable, right? But this is how we've been able to scale. And the thing about these numbers is that this is all supported by a team of SREs that hasn't really grown that much over the last decade or so. We've been able to exponentially become more productive because of the principles of DevOps that we've been able to implement as our SRE practice. Okay, And what has enabled this change is Borg, Kubernetes, containers. So it's not, you know, adopting the technology is not the end game. Just because I, you know, use, a Kuber use Kubernetes, okay, we've got Kubernetes cluster up and running, we've got DevOps, right? That's not how this works. That's just the beginning of it. You have to be able to start focusing on the people and the processes more than the technology itself. We have to shift our focus away from Kubernetes. I can't believe I'm saying that, right? We have to move it away from that and focus on the people and the process. That's how Google has gotten to where it's gotten. And the thing about Google is, you know, we see Google as like this ivory tower, this paragon of like, wow, they do everything so great. We don't. We screw up. We fall down and we fall hard sometimes. Every single problem that we've encountered is not that dissimilar from the problems of every government agency or commercial entity out there as well. There's a reason that the tools that we've open sourced over the years, specifically Kubernetes or especially Kubernetes, is so applicable to everyone. Because the same problems that you're facing are the same problems that we have faced. It's just that we faced them earlier. And we had to invent technologies that hadn't been there before for, to meet our needs. And we had the unique capability and the expertise to build them. 
And that's in large part why we release Kubernetes, because we know that not everyone is an advanced Go developer that is well-versed in distributed systems and containers and marrying the two together to create an, a container orchestration system or platform. And has, has anyone seen a graphic like this, people, process, technology, and a nice triangle? Yeah, I hate this stuff, right? Because there's no beginning. What, what does this tell me? It tells me, okay, there's something about people, there's something about process, there's something about technology, but it doesn't tell me where to start, right? So I drew this picture because I couldn't find this picture anywhere else on Google. I checked Google, and Google, you know, if Google can't tell me, then it doesn't exist. But, <laughs> um, hive mind, right? But the idea here is that given an enabling technology, like Kubernetes, I should be able to focus on the people that I have, the human resources that I have in my organization to adopt processes that I can evolve. So the processes that I have today in an organization, let's say we're releasing twice a year in the government agency that I'm thinking of. Once we adopt a technology, yes, there's a technical ramp up, yes, there's some training involved up front. But if I can now focus on the process and evolve that process to say, hey, you know what? We now have the ability to do uh, an automated rolling deployment. We can, we can do a rolling deployment, or we can do an AB, AB deploy, or a blue-green deploy, or whatever term you want to use, right? Canary or what have you. You can actually now change the process, and your people can now adopt that process. So it's not really an adoption of technology that gets you there. It's the adoption of a process. And the process change comes from the adoption of the technology. So it's a cascading effect. This is something that we have seen borne out at Google, and this is something that we have seen borne out at other organizations and companies that we have worked with. It's really about the people and the process, not so much about the technology. So run like, running like Google, the whole like run like Google concept, it's not literal. It's not like you have to be at a certain par or a certain point where you know, there's a bar here. If we're not releasing like in real time for every developer that commits, we're not running like Google. That's not the point. Running like Google, that entire term has kind of been misunderstood. It's more about the ability to be better as an organization, whatever that means for that organization. Leveraging the same principles that Google espouses through things like SRE or DevOps using technologies that Google has created stemming from the same use cases that we've had that you now share. Difficulties in, in rolling out a new version of an application. Do we really think Google hasn't had issues with that in the past? Of course we have. Kubernetes is a means, it's a tool. The end game is to reach and expand your potential, both as an individual, as a resource to your organization, as an organization itself. It's not so much about, hey, let's adopt this technology and it's just gonna change everything. It's really about shifting focus at the right time. Okay, how many folks actually work with Kubernetes where they work today? Good, that's a decent number. Not enough. How many would like to? Much bigger number, okay. Politics stopping you? Is it just time, effort, mainframe? <laughs> yeah. So that's understandable. And, and again, the cultural aspect is not going to go away, right? There are going to be some blockers. Um, and, and the same blockers exist at Google. What I'm trying to do is, is kind of tear down this veneer, this, this kind of like, you know, oh, it's Google. <laughs> right? We have problems. We have the same similar problems that everyone else has. Uh, especially, actually, in the government space. I've been covering public sector for my entire career, as I mentioned, and, and looking at the way Google does things and the problems that Google has had to overcome are really not that dissimilar from, from what everyone else has had to do. Uh, so I have a little bit of a demo. Now, assuming it doesn't break, uh, the idea behind development, and I'll uh, preface this a little bit. Can everyone see this? Everyone see that? Okay. Now, the, the, the idea behind this, and I've only got, what, five minutes, four minutes? Six. Six minutes. Okay. Plus questions. Okay. 
The idea behind developer productivity in Kubernetes has always been a question, right? I've, I've, been, I've been talking about our internal developers a lot and how they interact with Kubernetes and the Borg. Um, who sees Kubernetes as a developer tool? Man. Let me ask that question again. Who sees Kubernetes as a developer tool? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, the idea of being able to interact with Kubernetes as a developer is kind of what this year has been about so far, right? Last year was the year of Kubernetes. This year is now the year of, of, of the developer interacting with Kubernetes. So you have a lot of tools that are coming out that help us uh, in, in interacting with Kubernetes. Things like uh, Jenkins X, Scaffold. Um, uh, there's Helm, of course, which, by the way, just graduated to a, a prime member of CNCF. There's Draft, which is kind of pairing itself with Helm. There are many others. There is Gitkube, if any of you have heard of that. So there are plenty of tools out there, but it's, the usability is, is a little bit difficult. Um, now, what I'm doing right now is I'm just provisioning a cluster for myself. Uh, and, and the idea here is really just for me to be able to say, I want my own environment, my development environment. I want a three node Kubernetes cluster, and I want to be able to develop against that. It takes about two and a half minutes for me to, to provision my cluster. And I knew I was going to run up against time, so I pre-provisioned one already. Um, but for me to take this application right here, so on the left I have a simple Go application. All it does is really just, it's a stateful set, for those of you that know what a stateful set is, or it's a deployment, for those of you that don't. But it uses, it, it's a persistent application, um, and I expose it through uh, a load balancer. It's really just kind of no different than your three-tier three, three -tier application. But for me to interact with Kubernetes, normally I have to do a lot of uh, kind of finagling, maybe with Jenkins or some you know, other tools. As a developer, I just want to use the IDE. As a developer, I want tools that allow me to interact with Kubernetes or Minikube or whatever it is very easily, very seamlessly. I don't want extra daemons. I don't want extra things that don't comport with how I, as an OCD developer, want to be able to operate. I just want to use something very quick, very light, and that just fits in with how I develop normally. Um, and Scaffold, for example, is one such thing. I'm going to plug Scaffold because it's actually, it's, in my assessment, one of the better ones out there, if not the best. But what I've just done in that single command, I took my code, which I am sorry, Jamie, it does have a Docker file there. Um, <laughs> shaking his head. Uh, it, it built my container in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, push it to a registry, could be a shared organizational re registry for containers, and deployed it to my cluster. And it did that in a few seconds. And now I'm able to make changes in real time, and things will get rebuilt and redeployed for me on my behalf. So I have that iterative development experience in an actual Kubernetes environment. Okay, so no longer do I have to necessarily worry about having an entire VM on my machine just to be able to interact in a consistent way with what's going out to higher level environments. Right. Um, I just wanted to plug that because this is Dev Nation Federal, and I wanted to make a call out for developers to understand that tooling is improving, and I want you to actually explore this landscape because it, while it is evolving, there are phenomenal tools out there. Draft, Gitkube, Scaffold, there are a few others that I'm forgetting, uh, but I'll open it up to questions beyond that, and I, I thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. So before anybody asks any questions, think about your questions. What IDE are you using there? This is VS Code. Microsoft, Microsoft yes. Think yes. about that for VS a second. Code. Think about this crazy world we live in. You know, Jamie mentioned earlier GitHub, now Microsoft. Get this. This v is VS Code running on a Pixelbook. Yeah. As a right. Linux app in a container. I use VS Code on Linux. Yep. Crazy world. Uh, questions? Nothing for this brilliant person. Oh, there we go in the back. All right, here we go. Just a second. Hold up. I'll run. But we're not going to do a weightlifting contest because Tarek will beat me on that one. But swimming, biking, running, I'm in. <laughs> What's the scaffold tool you were talking about? Scaffold, um, it's, a, it's, it's a daemonless. It's, it's, it's just a command line client that basically will take, um, it allows you to define um, 
your working directory, and it'll take your code, a Docker file essentially, and it will build a container for you, or an, an image for you, push it out to a specified registry, and will also deploy that image to a specified Kubernetes environment for you. It's, just, it's a developer tool that can be plugged into a enter larger enterprise pipeline environment as well. But as a developer tool, it allows for iterative development. So if I'm making ch constant changes, I want to I wanna see what, what that change means, or what that looks like, Scaffold helps me do that. Yes? Question. Uh, how is it different from Terraform, for example? Terraform, so that's more like infrastructure provisioning. So if I wanted to provision like, uh, like some random like custom configured proxy uh, on a GCE instance, for example, I could use Terraform for that, right? That, that's more low level. So you could have like Terraform to provision some infrastructure, Ansible to configure that, uh, install some stuff, and then, and then away you go, if that makes sense. Yes? Uh, so when you said you make, you're making four billion uh, pods uh, a week. Yes. Um, just trying to understand like the, how, how, how you're using Kubernetes or Borg out there. What does that mean? Like every time someone hits go on search, they get their own pod, or what is it? Yes, what? it's a container. Yep, it's a short-lived container, but yes. Yeah. Any others? All right, well, with that, Tarek, thank you again, as thank always. You. Brilliant Appreciate stuff. It.